Amazing. Thanks, Sarah. This is very exciting. And um, we thought we would start with a piece um, from Rabbi Ira Stone. Um, it's actually the first source on your source sheets, um, where he talks about sort of how learning Torah itself, the act of learning Torah, is also an act of working on oneself. And interestingly, he specifically talks about chavruta learning, where two people are learning a text, and we're going to be talking about that pretty much in depth. What does it mean to learn in chavruta? And we're going to be doing that in chavruta. It's pretty meta. But uh, he talks about how the act of learning chavruta itself is, um, can be a spiritual practice that's about working on ourselves. And I just want to turn our attentions, uh, our attention to the second sort of paragraph where it starts with the specific mode of Torah study that Jewish tradition highlights is an interactive mode whereby learning proceeds always in dialogue with another person, um, which epitomizes the coming together of the various levels of Torah and Torah study. And then he says, in the very act of study, we are always standing before another whose real presence and real needs filter the potential meaning of the text, which I think is like just a very beautiful um, idea about the power of what it means to learn Torah with another human being. That we're experiencing the text in our own way, but it's always filtered through the other person and their experience. And so by definition, we're getting our own perspective, their perspective, and the text perspective in sort of this combination. Um, but then there's a very interesting um, sort of line which says, the act of study in this Chavruta face-to-face -face model requires prior attention to midot, right? Like our character traits really matter because actually <laughs> it's not just about you. The, 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 the potential of study, the power of Torah study is that it's not just about you or your perspective. And I have to like be very careful about how the other person is feeling. Um, what do you think about that, Sarah? I, I'm just thinking about that very careful piece I think, I think it's true, you do have to be so careful, but at the same time, I think that the, the height of Chavruta study, like the pinnacle of Chavruta study, is when you don't have to think about that carefulness mm -hmm. as much anymore. And so I would say, you have to be careful, but you also have to be really careful in choosing your Chavruta. And I think this quote helps us appreciate why um, it's, it's okay to study with someone and then say like, you know, it's not you, it's me. Um, <laughs> this is not gonna work out because you do have to have someone with whom you can have that flow of ideas that you just described and that it's described so beautifully in this text. And I think as, as an educator who uses the tool of Clubroots a lot, and I know you do too, it's important to tell people who are often used to, okay, like I'm gonna pair with someone, and I'm gonna make it work no matter what. And it's important to tell them like, this might not work so well for you. That's okay to move on to something else because we wanna get into this zone with Clubroots. I don't know if you've had any experiences of having to break up Clubroots in your class, <laughs> but but that's how I think about it. Right, it's a great point. Yeah, I, I love that because I think part of what you're saying is that when it really works, you actually don't need to be as careful. But, but hopefully what we're gonna see in a little bit is even when it really works, sometimes we can overstep. So that's an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic of like, you know, you can get to a place of total comfort and then what are the dangers that sort of are there? Yeah. Yeah, so the Gemara in 10, you know, is one of my favorites and, and, and gets at that idea of the, the care you have to take with Chavruta, but also the power that can really emerge from it. So that's the next source on the sheet, uh, if you're okay with that going there. Um, I, I, think, I think it's awesome when the Gemara actually talks self-consciously about Chavruta, but I think we have to look really carefully at the metaphors. So this is the Gemara in 10, Amr bichama, Amr bichanina, my dichtiv, barzel the barzel yichad. There's a pasuk in Mishle that says that iron sharpens iron. Um, actually, it goes on to say, and a, a person can sharpen their friend. Um, and what's the meaning of that pasuk? So the, the answer is, or the answer according to this interpretation is, um, Afshni tell me, um, just as with iron, one thing, one piece of iron can sharpen another. So two, two scholars, two Torah scholars can sharpen one another in halacha. And that's kind of the, the first image that we're given of what it, what it looks like um, to 
perform a chabrutza, what it looks like is one person sharpening the other. Two scholars, I think that's really interesting and important, that it's two people who are, in this case, on equal footing. They're both scholars of Torah, but when they rub up against each other, they can sharpen each other, they can make each other's Torah learning better, and that, that friction is, is why I say that it's not not a, meant to be a totally like, oh, I'm so careful about your feeling. Like that's not the experiences the Gemara describes it. It's like, let's, let's get at it. Let's rub up against each other and see what comes out of it. So that's the first, uh, that's the first metaphor. And then there's another one. How come Torah is compared to fire? As it says in Yomiyahu, my words are like fire. That's what God says. Just as one one piece of of uh, one fire can't burn on its own, right? You can't just have like one piece of wood. It won't like there's nothing for it to ignite. You need like a bundle of wood or a bundle of something for it to really blaze up and be a big fire. And there again, I think it makes so much sense. You just can't. The fire of Torah burns best when it's when it's paired, when it's in a group setting, but Fire is also something that is warm and wonderful and powerful and can get out of control. So I think it's not a coincidence that both of these are kind of a little bit violent images and mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't involve like the kind of everything is smooth sailing, chill chavruta that I think sometimes people like teach about and kind of advocate for like we're going to be a chavruta. That means you're going to say things, I'm going to be like, oh, that's great. And I'm going to say things, and you're going to go, that's great, right? Like that's, that's so not our chavruta. Um, a little bit it is because you say that to me a lot. But, <laughs> um, but I think that uh, you have to be ready to step in and be willing to sharpen the other person. And that, that kind of all comes to a head in the third metaphor here, or the third pasuk that's quoted. Um, what is this pasuk in Nimiyahu? Um, that the uh, the sword, um, it's a sword for the the boasters, for people who are arrogant, and they're going to become fools. That's no alu. Um, so the answer is that this pasuk means that um, there'll be a sword. also There'll be a sword against the enemies of these people, like the Tamidei Chachamim, they are, um, they're learning Torah, um, and the, the other people sit alone and study Torah, right, that, that brings you to becoming a fool, something like that, right? Basically, you're not going to get any smarter learning Torah on your own. Um, but again, it, it uses that metaphor of the story. It goes back to that image. Um, so, yeah, I'm probably like the more combative in our chavruta, maybe? No. No? I think so. But, um, but I think that, that this, I would always want to read that previous text that you read in, in conversation with the Skimmerian Tanit, because it's so important to remember that there's always meant to be a friction and a, a kind of argumentation going on in chavruta. Well, I want to I wanna, um, focus in on that for a second, Sarah, because I mean, it's interesting because in our chavruta, actually, usually what ends up happening is we argue for a second and then we understand each other's positions and start to argue the other side. That's sort of that our, true. that's the magical piece of our chavruta, I always feel. We manage to convince each other in one sentence and then suddenly are convinced that the other person's position is <laughs> so, totally true. Um, <laughs> so I don't know about how sharp we actually get, but, um, but why does it have to, I mean, it's an interesting question, right? Why do we have to be sharp? Why does it have to be fire? What do, why, do you, why does it be a sword? What's the, why do we need that level of sharpness or the potential for pain? Why do you think that that's important? I think it's about precision. I think that, um, I think that it's in, in the worlds of the rabbis, and I want to believe that this is true, Torah learning has real consequences. Like if you don't understand things, it's not like, oh, we're having like a nice conversation about Torah. Like, Maybe we'll get it right, maybe we'll get it wrong, who cares? It's not like that. Like Torah learning has real world consequences. <laughs> you see that throughout rabbinic literature and, um, and throughout halachic life. And so you want that precision. You want someone to hone your thoughts and help you really focus in on what's real. And I do think that, I don't think you have to be, I don't think you have to be like 
yelling at the other person in order for that to work. Although I certainly know a lot of corporates out there that are like that. So I think, <laughs> right, you and I do it without screaming at each other. Uh, <laughs> but there is definitely a sense in which I want to run my ideas by you because I know you'll tell me if my idea is wrong or I'm off base or there's something else I should have considered. So I think it's, it's that precision piece that really makes a difference. Yeah, and I think it's, I love that. And I think it's also interesting what you were saying about equals, because I do think you can't, right, as teachers, we know that if you're too sharp, or even sometimes a little sharp in the world that we're living in, you actually can't do this, right? You, you can't ask, you can't be equal swords or, right, um, or really mechadadit, like you can't be sharp like that. It doesn't work. And it's actually probably not healthy. But there's something I like that you were saying before about the equality piece. And I also think it's really important that we start with halakha. I think that that's a great point that, the, that in, the, in the rabbi's world, halakha and Torah study are, are this very similar pieces and that you can sharpen each other's halakha and it's as serious to sharpen each other's Torah. I think that's a really um, great point. Uh, I think there's also something here about loss of control that is interesting. Yes, you know, I think that's uh, like definitely the fire thing brings you there, right? Like fire can get out of hand if you're not careful. And there's something cool, I think, about when, when you're learning and you feel so lost in it that it sort of overtakes you and all you can think about is that sort of like, you know, we've, <laughs> we've certainly had moments in our chavruta where, you know, I'm just like, no, I, I can't. I can't with this text, you know? And, and <laughs> like, because I'm so overwhelmed by the problematic nature of it or sometimes the intense beauty of it. But, you know, and it's interesting because to me, I feel like you often pull me back in to be like, wait, wait, okay, let's look at it inside. What could it possibly be trying to help us with, you know, or teach us? Yeah, and I think the other part of that is remembering that sometimes you're in chavruta and sometimes you're in conversation and those are not necessarily the same thing. And when I think of that fire metaphor in particular, that's, that's what I think about that. Um, when, when you're, when you're consumed with the fire of Torah, it's like, it can be all encompassing. Um, sometimes, like you said, it's like, whoa, this is too much, but then you get out of chavruta and you have to remember not to talk to other people like you're in chavruta all the time. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's really, it's totally happened in my life. I know it's happened in your life uh, that someone's talking, you're like arguing with them. And they're like, why are you arguing with me? And it's like, oh, sorry. Like, I just do that with my kids all the time. Right. Um, and we think that's a perfectly normal way to converse. And, and it's hard because you really want to teach people those chavruta skills. I think that is the mecharadina, chadad hashini piece that I want to challenge you to tell me why you read the source that way. And I want to question you based on another source. And I want to push you to have that precision and be your best self. You cannot do that in every conversational setting. That is definitely important to remember. So that, uh, that is, you know, we even have the idea that like, you know, God is a shofla, right? That, that God is a, as a divine force in the world can get kind of out of control, um, necessary and positive, but also a little bit dangerous. And I, I personally don't mind the idea that Chavruta is a little bit dangerous. I think anything with that much power of course, can go too far. And part of the, the fun and the challenge is reining it in enough to make it useful to us. I like that language of reining it in. That's a great, that's a great point. Yeah. So I, I'm happy to, to go on to the next source, which is maybe an example of not reining it in so well. Um, <laughs> I think you and I each have some, have like our favorite coverage of stories. This one might be mine. Um, I love teaching about Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish, who are famous chavrutas in the Gemara. Um, they, they didn't start out as chavrutas. And I think going back to your point about equals, Yaf, like they weren't, they weren't really equals when they started. And I think it's important to maybe point that out that you don't necessarily like the Talmudei Chachamim in in that Tanit source in my mind is like a it's a broad term right you don't have to be the most scholarly of the scholars to enter into this relationship it's just about being able to achieve some kind of parity in your relationship with this with the other person so here's the story in in Bav um starts starts with their origin story which is not a story that Yafa and I are sharing about ourselves today but maybe another time <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> 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 
Ryokanan, who parenthetically was an extremely attractive person. He was kind of like a, the, the, um, the rock star of Talmudic rabbis, shall we say. He was um, apparently very attractive. So he was swimming in the Jordan River. Chazi Reish Lakish, Veshavar Liyordana Abatre. And Rabbi Yochanan, uh, Rabbi Reish Lakish saw him and jumped into the water after him. Amarle, Chelech Raita. And Rabbi Yochanan said, you should use your strength for Torah, which is just a great phrase. He's like, oh, look at you, strong swimmer. You should be using that for Torah. Amarle, Shufrech Lanashe. And Reish Lakish says right back to him, you should use your attractive beauty for women. Um, and I have to say, it's not exactly what we're talking about, but I love this moment. I think you and I have spoken about this before because I think that, um, like I think you and I had this in some way, like I think great chavritas maybe have like a clicking moment where they're just like, oh yeah, like this is, this is not everybody. Sometimes it takes a while to like settle in, I'm not saying that this is like, you don't have, doesn't have to be love at first sight with your chavritza, but sometimes it is. And I think, they each have like a snappy, a snappy statement to say to the other. Um, and so then Rabbi Yochanan says back to him, um, He says, if you come back, like if you come back to Torah, Rabbi Yochanan says to Rish Lakish, I'll give you my sister in marriage. Um, and she's even more attractive than I am. Um, so we'll bracket the um, problematics of that for a sec, yeah. Um, <laughs> because otherwise we would just overtake this Chavruta <laughs> hour about this, which is not what the topic is, but we exactly. could talk about otherwise, that, 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 Maybe that's next year's Global Day. Um, <laughs> right. so, so well, actually, they did beauty already, but yeah. They did, right. That's um, true. <laughs> uh, and then Rabbi Rishlak, he's tried to get out of the water to get his clothes on. He tried to like get back out and he, he couldn't. His strength kind of failed him in that moment. Um, he seems like signaling he's like entering a new phase of his life. It was all about his physical strength beforehand. Rishakish famously was a, was a gladiator, was like a, a, a highwayman. He was, he was uh, not a savory character. Um, but now he's turning over a new leaf. Um, so he learns a cry that he became a great Shavu Gaba rabbi. He became a great Torah scholar. Um, and from there on, they can kind of take this, uh, they can take this chavruta and run with it because, um, because now they're in the same place, basically. And there's tons of stories throughout the Gemara about Biochan and Rishakish learning together. If we had more time, um, as you know, I love to teach all those texts about times when Rishakish contradicts Rabbi Yochan and Rabbi Yochanan's like, all right, there's nothing I can really do, which is basically what I say when people tell me, like, Yaffa said this and Yaffa said that. I'm like, all right, well, I guess she must be right. Because she's not um, so that's, that's not true. <laughs> that's all over the Gemara. Um, but that's fine. Um, and then the Gemara here kind of skips over all of that and goes on. Yomachad havu mifluge be midrasha. One day they were arguing, they were fighting in the Beit Midrash, um, but like arguing, fighting. Um, they go through a list of, of weapons. They want to know when, they, when these things can be makabel tuma, when they can take on ritual impurity. In order for something to take on ritual impurity, it has to be a full-fledged kli. It has to be like done. And if you're asking yourself, why would I ever care? The answer is you would not. And neither really would they, which is always so striking to me. And that's okay because... The, the real consequences for purity and impurity were only in the time of the temple. I know that there were remnants of it still in their time, but still it seems to me like this should not have been a super high stakes argument for them. Um, but they do, they get into really big arguments about it, um, about when is when is it considered actually done? And they have two different positions on this. Um, they disagree. And Rabbi Yochanan, hearing that Rachel Kish disagrees with him, says basically the bandit knows his trade. Lista the list you to yad. Ugh, the worst. I know you hate that part. I that line is so painful. And then <laughs> shows me. Rish Lucky says back to him, Umaya Hansley, Hatam Rabbi Karuli, Hatha Rabbi Karuli says, what have you done for me lately? Because I was like the boss of the banditry world and here they also call me rabbi. And it's not it's not really so different. And in this moment their Khabrutsa completely falls apart. And so I wanted to put this text in conversation with the, the piece we saw before and, and, and even the piece that you read 
because this is where the chavruta, they forget to stop, right? They forget to sort of check it. It's how I read it. Um, and they are now in a real fight instead of being in a, in just like a Torah fight. Um, they kind of forget that this is, like I said, not even that high stakes at the halakhic argument. And now they're really, they're really in it. Um, and everything, everything kind of really goes downhill after that. Um, because then Rabbi Yochanan is really hurt and he says, well, I, I actually, I, like, I brought you closer to Torah. I brought you closer to God. Like, what do you mean? What have I done for you? Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan gets sick. Chalash Reish Lakish, and Reish Lakish also gets sick. And this is something that I love more than anything about the Gemara, that words in the Gemara have real life consequences. They, um, they actually impact the way the world looks and feels. So can words harm, can words kill in the Gemara? Absolutely. And, and think about what, how much power their words had. These are like the top scholars of their generation. They're talking talking in Torah all day long. Their words are so powerful. And now they say the wrong thing to each other and they literally physically make each other sick. And then Rabbi Yochanan's sister comes forward because she, of course, is married to Reish Lakish. So Ata Achte Kabachya. And she's crying to Rabbi Yochanan. Amrleya said Bishfield Banai. And she says, I know you hate this. She says, Rabbi Yochanan, you've got to forgive Reish Lakish. This hurts me. Do it for my children. And she has a pasuk to prove it. Um, and uh, oh, sorry, he has a pasuk. He says, "Amar la azvaya tamecha niach um, He quotes a pasuk that basically is God saying, "No, no, no, no worries. Like God will take care of everything. God will take care of the orphans." Um, and she says, "Asev shvil almonati. If you don't forgive him, I'm going to be a widow. You've got to forgive him." Um, and he says back to her, also from Yirmiyahu, "Almonatecha lai tiptach." Right? That like, no, 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 widows can also trust in God. Baby, basically, Rabbi Yochanan is not hearing her at all. He's completely deaf to her, to her words. And I think, it's interesting, Yaf, I just thought, like, this could almost be a moment of chavruta between, mm. between Rabbi Yochanan and his sister. His sister. Nice. Because there's text involved, but he's totally closed off, right? He's just using the text as a weapon or even, like, as a shield. Right? Like I have a hmm. suit for this and I'm not willing to actually engage with you. Okay. I think that is what can happen that you can retreat into Torah as a way of avoiding having a real conversation. Um, anyway, That's beautiful. He does Love that. That's so great. It's a, That's great, a great read. I never thought about that before, um, which is why you should always learn text in Kavruta. Um, <laughs> And, awesome. and then he dies. Nach nafshe derby. Wait, sorry. Can I just ask you one quick question, yeah. though? Back to there. Back to your new read. So, do you think that the that the I and the me there is Hashem, or do you think it's a Yochanan? Oh, that's interesting. How I mean, is he using that text to say, "Oh yeah, it's okay. You don't need him because you have me," or is he saying you don't need him because you have God? That's interesting. I had always assumed it was you don't need him because you have God. But maybe it's me, but I actually think in my new read, it's like not even either. It's like basically just like, oh, you're talking about orphans? I've got a pasuk about orphans. You're talking about widows? I have a pasuk about that too. Right, but I, I, I would read it as me now. I, I've always read it as God also. And I, I think actually the God read probably strengthens your read. Like, I'm not worried about that. I have Torah in my hand and I've God on my side and I'm not worried about you. I don't see you and Torah's user. But I think it's an interesting thing to think about whether he's like, look, I'm... Because part of this whole thing is Ryohan losing sight of who he is. And there's a, lot, there's a lot of, I think, there's a lot of megalomania here, you know? And there is a question, which we've talked about before also, how you can use knowledge. Knowledge can help you feel superior to others. And there, I think we're watching Rabbi Yochanan experience that right now. Yeah, what I like about that read is that it really sets up the rest of the story because then it means that at this point in time, he thinks like, I am fine, right? Which I mean, it's a little weird because it did say Chalash Date to Rabbi Yochanan, but he basically thinks like, I'm, I'm going to be fine, right? It's, it's going to be okay for me, right? Like, I'm not going to forgive Reish Lakish. And yeah, maybe he's going to die. Like, he seems to accept the fact that his, his anger has, has real world consequences. Right. He's like, maybe he's going to die, but like, I'm going to be fine. Me and mine, right? We're going to be fine. So I like that reading. But, that you mentioned because it kind of sets it up for like why it goes so wrong for him after. Well, I think Sarah, based, based on what you just said, 
what's interesting is, well, why is Chalash Da'ate Dovi Yochanan? What is he sad about? Is he sad that he's losing his Chavir Dovi Lakish, or is he sad? I mean, we, to unpack this more, but I'm curious to hear you have to say about this, because I wonder, I always thought he was like, just insulted by Rabbi Reish Lakish, but I think there's something else when Reish Lakish basically rejects everything that Rabbi Yochanan did for him. Totally. I think it's totally undermining of like the last however many years of Rabbi Yochanan's life. I think, so it's, like, call- I think it's like one of those moments where like, you know, you're like, oh, the relationship didn't mean to you what it exactly. meant to all along. Yes. Like, yes. That's devastating. That's not just like someone that's being nasty to you. That changes your view retroactively on however many years of your life. Right. And it really hurts. Yeah, it really hurts. I, it's very painful to be like, it's like, feels like the whole thing was like a betrayal somewhere. But there's also something going on about what Rachel Keish saying, I was actually, I didn't think about this till the second, Sarah. <laughs> but actually, there they call me Rebbe, here they call me Rebbe, like, um, that makes it about Rachel Keish making it about himself and his power. Right. I was powerful before. I'm powerful now. And, Rachel, and Rabbi Yochanan's like, how can you not see that? It's totally different. Right. Yeah. It's totally different. Right. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm willing to totally accept that it, it could be that he's saying, like, it's me, it's me, it's me. Um, and so I do kind of think that he, I don't think he should be shocked when, I, I don't think he's shocked when Rachel Kish dies. I don't think that's the plot twist. I think he didn't expect, though, how he would feel afterwards, based on what you were saying, right? Where he's like, I'm going to be fine. It's I can take care of this. And now he doesn't know. But have a kamid star, Rabbi Yochanan Batre too, right? Afterwards, it even uses the word Batre. Like after that, Rabbi Yochanan's really distraught. Um, and the rabbis say, I'm a rabbanan, man lizel yate lizate, and these are Rabbi ben Pdat. So who's going to go and be me a shev dat of, of Rabbi Yochanan? Right? Who's going to make him feel better? We're going to send Rabbi Yochanan ben Pdat to Mechadadin Shmatse, because he's like very sharp in learning uses the word sharp again there, right? Just to notice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sharpen. Yes. And every time Rabbi Yochanan would say something, he would say, you know, there's a braid that supports you. Um, right, so he says, are you, you think you're Rish Lakish? Like if I said something to Rish Lakish, he would ask me anything that I said, he would ask me 24 questions. Um, and then we would have all these answers. We would have all these, this discussion, all these answers. Um, mm-hmm. and, and Torah learning would grow because of it. You're saying, oh, there's a bright that supports you. I know this is the best part. He's right? like, I don't know I say smart things. Like, die, I wouldn't have said it if it wasn't brilliant. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that conversation doesn't go well. And I think this really takes us back to what we were saying before that actually, and I've totally experienced this, this and I bet you have too, actually, which is just like super boring and goes nowhere. When you read a text and you're like, here's what I think it means. And the other person is like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, what, what do you say to that? You're like, okay, cool. Let's read the next line. Um, not fun at all. Not interesting at all. And for Rabbi Yochanan, I think, I think this is where he realizes, I mean, I, I do think, I know that you really don't like Rabbi Yochanan in this story. I feel more sympathetic to him, but I do feel like for Rabbi Yochanan, what goes wrong is that the Chavruta was in a way always all about him for him. Um, and he's like, but he didn't realize, I think, how catastrophic it was going to be to lose that force of his life. I really believe that he was naive in that way. He just, he was so caught up in himself that he didn't realize, oh, I actually really need Rachel Akish. Like, I really, really need him. And now he doesn't have him. He's like, I still say smart things, but I just don't have anyone to help me grow the Torah around me in that way. Um, and the end of the story, he goes around, he tears his clothing, he's crying. He says, where are you, Rachel Kish? Where are you, Rachel Kish? Where are you, Rachel Kish? And he, he drives himself crazy, essentially. And so the rabbis pray for mercy on him and he dies too. And it's kind of a Romeo and Juliet, everyone's dead at the end story. Super, super sad. Don't you feel any sympathy for Rabbi Yochanan here? Um, 
I don't have a lot of sympathy for Rabbi Yochanan, as you know. I don't because I think he, I think that there was a moment in their relationship when they could have been equals and, or they receive, they get to being equal. But Rabbi Yochanan cannot let go of him being the teacher. Like even that language of I brought you tachad kanfea shchina is like, no, no, you didn't. Like actually just by being you, you're, you have access to the shchina. Like I taught you Torah, but I, I don't think he ever gets over being the puppet master in a way. The whole thing is so puppety. Even though I hear, I, I like that point you made earlier about um, them having this magic chavruta moment. I like that, mostly because it ties into our magical chavruta moment. But um, but I would, and I never really thought about those snappy words as as being a magical chavruta moment. And I like that a lot. Um, and it's interesting. I didn't notice until right now, Sarah. This um, the clothing connection of tearing his clothing yeah. and he can't clothing at the beginning, yeah. Clothing, yeah. So that, I never thought about that parallel, but I don't. I don't think that Rabbi Yochanan ever gets over himself in this whole story. And so, going back to Rish Lakish's past, it's almost like Rish Lakish has no choice but to say, "You didn't change me. You didn't." And I can imagine that's like an old connection between the two of them, where like he can't. Rabbi Yochanan refuses to let go of where he found Rachel Lakish. Or, and and Rachel Lakish is like, oh, again, you bring up my history? Like, again? Like, why do you think you did such a, why do you think you were so important in my development? You know? Even if he was, there's a way, I, it feels to me like it's like an old scar between the two of them. And, and you know, one of the things that we talked about in the past is this question of like, how do you bring in your past dynamic? And what is your responsibility to the other person to not bring up the past, you know? <laughs> and also to let things go. I mean, we don't, thank God, we don't have this issue really so much actually, because we switch sides to be each other's defenders, but which is great and miraculous. But like, there is a way in which sometimes old Havruta arguments can creep back in. Like, oh yeah, well, this is what you think in general about Rabbi Yochanan, right, for example, right? So it's like- I say that lovingly. <laughs> Right. No, I know. I, I'm saying it's definitely. Right. Always, but, but it is interesting to, to notice it. Like, the, well, I know that you think this. And so it, it like makes its way. And sometimes it's awesome. Because it's like, oh, look, you've seen this the, for the seventh time. It's kind of a way of building patterns. And sometimes it's bad because you're like, well, I want to move past right. that mm -hmm. read or something. And, and or forgetting text, just sort of bringing in other pieces of a person's past sometimes can be enrich that chavruta, I think as, as, as Iris Stone, Rabbi Iris Stone said to us at the beginning, right, that the, the other person's dynamic can enrich us and help us be better, and sometimes it can actually hurt the other person and not let them move on and grow. And I think that's what we're watching happen for Yochanan here, is like, he doesn't let Rich, like, he sh get over his past, and that's not fair. I know, but that's why I feel bad for him. I think it's tragic. Like, I think it's true. He never gets past himself. And it's just too bad he didn't have a good therapist, right? Like he, he did, it's not that he didn't value that karuta. I, I really believe he did love learning with Rachel Akish. He just didn't, like you said, he never, he never figured out how to make it not about himself. And I feel bad for him that he didn't figure that out. I feel like they, they could have had such a good thing. They almost had such a good thing, you know, and, and I know it's not so fair because I didn't quote these texts this time, but like there are other places, as I mentioned before, where we see him deferring to Rachel Akish, like, he, he had an appreciation of the fact that Rachel Kish was a brilliant halachic mind. It's not like he, like he didn't know that at all. It's just like some personal hang up. Like you said, it's like never getting past that read. It's like he just couldn't quite let go. And I, I believe that at the end, he, he did realize where he'd gone wrong. I think that like Hecha Adbar Lakisha is so tragic be, like because it was his own fault. It'd be less tragic if he were just a victim. I think it's always worse when you know that you were at fault in some way. Yes, I do agree that it's painful. Yeah, what, can I ask, why do you think it's Bar Lakisha? Why do you think he calls him that? Like, I've always sort of wondered about why, why he's Hechad Bar Lakisha, not Rish Lakish or... I mean, in general, I, I don't know why they switch off with Rish Lakish's name so much, so... I'm not, I'm not so sure. But I do think it's interesting. He doesn't use, um, he, right, Rish Lakish is, is sometimes referred to as Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon Ben Lakish, but he gets the honorific of Rabbi much less frequently. 
Mm. I think there is a way in which he preserves his previous personality. Um, always. Interesting. Yeah. And it, it comes, like, the Gemara brings it up multiple times, right? That he has this past, et cetera. So I think it was something part of his personality. Well, that's interesting, actually, because it's like, not only can Rabbi Yochanan not get over his past, but like, even the Gemara can't seem to get over his past. Like, and maybe that's why he calls him Bar Lakisha, like, going back to his roots. Like, I couldn't get over your roots, but now I miss you. I miss what I couldn't get over. I couldn't get over you as Bar Lakisha or outside of our conversation. And now, I miss you, you know? Yeah. Um, and there's an interesting thing about, you know, when he says, you know, don't I know that I, don't, don't I know that I'm saying, well, I'm saying good. Like, you know, that's like an interesting moment of like, I thought that's what it was about. I thought it was about me being smart. Yeah. Right. And he's like, now I realize that's just not where it's at. Who cares that I was right? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So even though it's tragic, this is still one of my favorite Chavrusa stories. I think because they have that click at the beginning, um, even though it gets out of hand and it just goes so badly. But again, I do believe that at the end, Rabbi Yochanan realizes really deeply what he lost. So. Hmm. Yeah, so it's a cautionary tale, really. <laughs> it is a cautionary tale. Cautionary tale. <laughs> cautionary tale of Chavrusa learning. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm gonna do my favorite Chavrut de Pair now, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, and, and we are, I, I would say Sarah and I are in a debate about, <laughs> about whether or not there really were Chavrutas. And I think that that's fair. And it's interesting because in a way, like we're sort of redefining Chavruta as anytime two people utilize text as a means to discuss anything. And, um, and that's why I love what you were saying about um, Rabbi Yochan's sister, which is awesome. Right, that now that's just like a conversation, but Rabbi Yochanan is like, oh, here's some text, and therefore we're now in a chavruta moment. I love that. So I want to I want to steal that as we go on to Brewery and Rabbi Meir, and this is a text that we've learned together many times, and I've had the pleasure of learning um, many times, and love it a lot. And I think it's sort of if Rabbi Yochanan Shakish is like an example of where chavruta goes wrong, if we decide to read Rabbi, Yoch Rabbi Meir and Bruria, who were husband and wife, at least according to some places in the Gemara. Um, <laughs> um, um, then if we are willing to see them as Chavruta partners, then this is sort of a story where Chavruta goes right, if you will. And um, I'm going to read source number five on your pages. Hanu biryone de habu b'shivavute de Rabbi Meir. So there once were some biryonim, which are translated here as zealots, but it's a big question exactly who these people are. Um, likely they are Jews who wanted to uh, fight against the Roman authorities and the rabbis were really not pro that strategy. Um, and they bothered him a lot, right? Uh, it really caused him a lot of pain. Have a by Rabbi Meir, Rachme, Elihu, right? The mayor uh, prayed for mercy um, on them, but really that means about them, I think, that they should die, right? Which is a totally logical, normal response for a rabbi when he doesn't like his neighbors to pray that they die. Um, <clears throat> so part of this conversation that we've been having is when rabbis get out of control with their, either per sukim, either their verses or their prayers. Um, so this is an example, I would say, Rabbi Mayer, reacting emotionally. Sarah, would you agree with that? I do, but I still just love, because, you know, like, I get into conversations with people sometimes, like, oh, these stories in the Gemara, like, are they really true? Are they not really true? I'm like, that's not the point. Like, the point is to suspend belief and live in this world of magical realism with the, with the rabbis, where, like, if you, if your Torah is strong enough, you pray for someone to die, like, they could die. That's dangerous. That's, again, for me, an example of, this, this ongoing metaphor of Torah being so sharp and so powerful in the world. So I don't think, I do think it's an overreaction. I don't think he should have done that. I'm not approving, but I'm just appreciating. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think it's a great, another great example where words can kill, right? So we've seen words killing, right? In terms of insulting one another or, or hurting one another, but this is a place where words can kill, can have the potential to kill vis-a-vis -vis God, right? Which is also very interesting. And I like that you said if your Torah is strong enough, 
you can pray. But I wonder if it's like, is it your Torah or is it your connection with God? I mean, it's an interesting question what he's calling upon there. That's right? how you connect connected to God in the Gemara. You learn lots of Torah. Right, right, right. So this, the same thing, they're the same thing. Yep. Um, <laughs> but I do think it's very significant to notice that Rabbi Mayer's initial reaction is very, very extreme. Whereas his wife, Buria, is quite calm and comes in. Um, Amrali Buria debates who his wife, Buria, says to him. And this, as you know, Sarah and I, <laughs> if you know that I read this, you can read this sentence in many different tones, I would say. And I'm even willing to read it in a calmer tone. I do think the way that I prefer to read this piece is to say like this. My datech, what are you thinking, you idiot, basically. Mishum dichtiv. Hitamu chotim, right? Is it because the verse in Tehillim says sinners should die? Now, there's a big question here because this is presumably, um, this is, um, and it's source six on your pages, right? Whether How you read, Hitamu chataim min haaretz. And interestingly, the English translation that we have here, may sinners disappear from the earth. But actually what Burya is suggesting to him is, don't understand chataim as sinners, right? Don't read the mikti chataim. Is it written sinners with a vav and therefore it would mean sinners? No, chataim ktiv, she says. No, chataim meaning sins as opposed to sinners. Read it that way. Read the text. And this is, I think, interesting. And there's a lot, of course, we can say about gender here, right? Read the text with compassion. Make sure to read here, let sin cease, not sinners. Don't pray for their death, but rather pray about their behavior, right? If you will, hate the sin, not the sinner, the saying, right? That's clearly a parallel to this, right? But the ode, right, feel the sefe, the sefe, right? Read the end, the krav, read the end of the verse, where Sha'im ode enam, right? If you pray that there will be no more sins, then there, by definition, there'll be no more sinners, right? Now, do you have to read the text this way? You really don't. And in fact, you'll see here that the English actually says that there are two parts of the same verse. May sinners disappear from the earth and the wicked be no more. When I have no more sinners, I'll have no more wicked people. Okay, but she reads it as, right? Hevan di tamu chataim, since there are no more sins, right? Ushaim odeinam, then there will be no more sinners, right? Ella bai rachme alaihu bilahadru b'tshuva, rather, Pray for mercy on them that they will do tshuva. Urishaim od enam. Sorry, that's the same sentence again. Um, the hadru b'tshuva. Sorry, that's the end of the of the gemara. There. Okay, so rather pray for them that they should um, repent. Let them do tshuva. And um, the end of the gemara there says, even though I don't have it in front of me, I'm so sorry. The end of the gemara there says. Um, rather, pray for them that they will do tshuva. And in fact, the, the postscript of the Gemara is, he does pray for them, and they do do tshuva, and they live, and everything. everyone lives happily ever after. Um, <laughs> which is a much better story than everyone dies at the end. <laughs> um, in my opinion, much better to see everyone lives happily. You're not, you're not a Shakespearean tragedy person, I think. Exactly. It's just like a different... One of us likes the tragedy, one of us likes the comedy. It just goes to show you a little bit about why our hobbies don't work so well. <laughs> <laughs> no, we both like both. But um, but I think there's, as we've discussed many times, I think that there's um, a lot of, a lot of, um, it's a lot to learn from this piece, right? Particularly about how we choose to use text. I think it's interesting that we don't hear anything about Rabbi Meir, he doesn't respond to her in any way, he just does what she says, right? Which I think is sort of a very fascinating point here where he doesn't question her reading of the text, even though he easily could have. He could have easily said to her, you can read it both ways, and I'm choosing to read it this way, and God is on my side, and the same way that Rabbi Yochanan does. She could, he could have said to her, listen, Buria, thanks for that really compassionate reading, but actually these are bad guys, they're Rishaim, and Hashem doesn't want Rishaim. That's just not what God wants on this earth. And I'm praying that for that. And God will listen to me. And I do think it's sort of an interesting thing to notice that like, um, um, that God does in fact listen, right? Like in other words, he does pray. And that prayer, once again, so if we're talking about words having power, 
Words have power to destroy, which is the beginning of this, and words have power to cause others to repent. And, and both of those things are important. The power of words here is critically important to this story. And, and Remeyer is moved by her words and her reading of the text. And as a result, his words change and their behavior changes. So that combination, I think, is really quite um, powerful and important. Um, what do you think, Sarah? I think that's right. I mean, for me, you mentioned like we're not totally, we're never totally sure. We never totally agree about whether or not this is really a chavruta. And I just think I kind of want him to say something back to her. Yeah. Um, to me, this feels like if I'm going to see a chavruta here, it has to be kind of like in the backstory. Like if you said to me, like, oh no, Sarah, like you have to read the text this way, I would maybe just act on it, but only because we've been learning together for so long and I trust your reading of text. Um, yes. So I think there has to be, to see this as a successful Kavaruta moment, I have to like imagine a backstory where he's like, no, 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 like I trust your reading of text. I mean, I guess the other option is he's like, oh, I guess praying for people to live is actually preferable to, for praying for people to die, right? Which could also be that Ray Mayer had that, you know, had that thought, which, you know, he agreed with you and, and that's fine. Um, but I do, I do think that I like to read this in the context of like, well, they, they must be used to talking about text together. And, and I, think, I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that when you, if you are someone who spends a lot of time in Chavruta, that tends to be like your pattern of speech. And so I'm comfortable saying that someone like Ruby Mayer, really, I think that's probably that all of Chazal, like they just spent so much time in that mode. And some of them like so, so much time, right? Like they left their families. Like, of course, when they came home, they would speak to their families that way too. I can't imagine not. It's not something that you can so easily turn on and off. Um, so, so that's kind of how I see it. She, he knew that it was a strong reading of the text because he trusted her and her reads of texts, and that's why he's willing to act on it. But I love that. And I'm curious because I think it, it's interesting to me that I do think that there's a bit of a critique here. There's, there's like a level of self-awareness where it's like, oh, I, in order to not pray someone dies, like I need a pasuk, you know? And, and like that my datech thing, when she says, what are you thinking? Could be like, what are, you, what are you thinking? It's crazy, you don't need a pasuk to tell you this. In fact, I'm gonna read a pasuk in a different way. And you know, it could be just appealing to his natural morality or it could be my datech, right? Like you're, you live your life according to pasukim, which I really think is true for them, right? We really see that, right? In all these areas and you know, even even with small children, right? One of some we've talked about this before, but like it's so cute when like they're like, okay, so so cash, right? Give me a pasuk, you know, and it's like it suddenly tells me everything I need to know about the situation that I'm living in, right? So there's something in that that's real and pure, but there's there's something also interesting here of like actually she could have said to him, Don't be an idiot. God doesn't want people to die. And did she even need that pasuk or not, you know? I, of course, want to say, of course she did, because that's, that's their mode of communication. But there's also a question, I wonder, like, for the people. No, I, I think she for sure did. Like, I think, I mean, I guess because, right, the other option is to assume I'm married to, like, basically a homicidal maniac, right? Like, <laughs> really, because she doesn't make that move, right? Like, if, if it were just the morality thing, she'd be like, what are you thinking? You're crazy. You want to kill them? No, like, we don't kill people, honey, right? Like, and, and instead, she says to him, she gives him, it's a way of giving him the benefit of the doubt, I think. She thinks, she was like, oh, are you thinking about this pasuk? No, 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 it's okay. You're not a crazy homicidal maniac. You just read the pasuk wrong. And that happens all the time, right? Like you just read the pasuk wrong. You just need to be redirected and like, it's fine. I, I think that's the conversation because otherwise, like I said, she's basically saying we don't kill people. And that's like a crazy thing to have to say to your spouse. Right, unless, yeah, right. Unless the context here is that these Duryonim were so bad that like in theory, they could have been beyond repair. And he could have been thinking that. That's another benefit of the doubt. Read in general for Mayor, right? I don't feel like that's as much benefit. Maybe it's just because I can't relate to like, honey, we're gonna go kill some people. Like, I just think that's not as much benefit of the doubt. Right, well, we're not gonna kill them. God is gonna kill them because they're deserving, presumably. Okay, but, but it's still, right? He's gonna like take a step in that direction. I mean, he's not gonna be tried for murder on the basis of it, but. I do think I do think she's saying to him, I know that your decisions are always made on the basis of Torah, and I want to engage you 
in this conversation. I don't think you're making the right Torah decision. I think it goes back to that idea that we started with about Torah being so high stakes. Right. I, I think it's interesting. I, I really love what you're saying about um, only because they have this relationship does he trust her read of the text. So, that, so, it's, so really what I hear you saying is learning a Chavrita is never just about the text. It's never just about that, right? Neither in the... Not in Rabbi, not, not in Rabbi Yochanan Rachel Lakish, not here. It's never just about the Torah that you're learning. And like you were saying about the, the Shaila, like the question at heart for Rabbi Yochanan Rachel Lakish was actually totally irrelevant in their day-to-day -day, or mostly irrelevant in their day-to-day -day life, which is totally not the case here, right? Here, this is actually like the most relevant because it's literally my next door neighbor and it's literally people who I think are actually destroying our safety, right? I actually believe that these people are a threat to us. So I don't think it's just like, you know, they have really loud parties, right? This is like something ex existential <laughs> in our neighborhood and, and who is with us and who's against us, real questions. But, but you're saying, but if she would have, if it would have been someone he didn't trust so much and he just, she just set up a souk or a read, it wouldn't have been as powerful to him. So that, that I think is like an interesting point that it's always Torah plus the person. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and that's very powerful and also very dangerous when it goes wrong. I think, I think it goes back, I think you said that earlier, like, I think I'm just reflecting that back to you, that like, right, like when you talked about, well, there's always that thing in your past, and do you go back to it or not? And, and even where we started about respecting the person and making sure to be careful not to hurt them, yeah, there's definitely a person there, and you can't, the Torah is never divorced from the person you're learning it with, and so I do think that that for sure informs their conversation here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. So I'm willing to read it with you as a chavruta. Um, I just, what? I, so I'm willing, so I guess at the end, I am willing to read this conversation as a, like I do think Ray Mayer and Bria were chavrutas. I just think that we're hearing like a small fraction of their chavruta conversation. And there must have been so much more and too bad that the, uh, that the Gemara didn't record. <laughs> Tell us more. And also they also have their own moment of uh, Shakespearean tragedy as we know, but yeah. that's for another, again, for another, another day. Another share, another time. <laughs> well, the fun thing is, Yaf, you and I are going to be wrapping this up in a few minutes, but we are learning together in, in just a few days, right? Our next schedule cover says <laughs> Thursday morning. We'll actually be in one. So maybe, maybe we're not inviting people to tune in there, but um, I think these conversations really help me think about how much Chavruta has mattered in our own lives. Um, I think that's, um, we mentioned at the beginning, we've been covered it for 16 years. And, you know, it's, it's interesting also to think about, let's say, any of these pairs who presumably were together for a long time, like we don't have an exact span of years, but it was over a long time, because some things stay really constant. Like, I think the way that we learn together now is basically the way that we learn together from day one. And that's something that's amazing about our Chavruta. And so there are ways that I, you know, maybe you could say to me like, oh, Sarah, like, you know, you always think that, or you've always thought that, and that's true. <laughs> but then I think about how much has changed in our lives. We've moved countries and places and, um, right, so so many things have changed in our lives. Jobs, like, things are constantly kids. in our lives. Kids, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and the fact that the learning is a constant, I don't know, I think to me, that feels like something that could be a piece of Bria and Marie Mayer's relationship, actually, is that like when, when Torah is part of the core of your relationship, it stays stable in a way that other things don't. And so I don't, I don't judge them. I kind of like that they're always like, oh, I have a pasuk for that. I have a pasuk for that, like you were saying, because it's like I feel that in my own life that Torah is the bedrock and those, that Torah relationship is like a constant and whatever else shifts, it shifts around it. And, and we have that at the core. I totally agree with that. I have to say that, um, you know, the, you can, like, you can put a schedule, you can put something in your schedule to have a phone call that's constant, and it's not the same thing as having a chavruta that's constant. And, you know, we can measure our relationship on what we were talking about last week and what was going on in our lives and what was going on in the text. And sometimes, Right, like, oh, last week we talked about this because we were, oh, then that thing came up and we can measure our lives by our chavruta. And I think it's, 
incredibly powerful and it's a huge gift. I mean, there are very few people who in this world who have seen my growth as a human, but also in Tura, like you have. And, and it's interesting to me also when the moments are where we say, okay, we're not going to continue learning about Azara this week, but here's a shear I'm giving. I need you to help me with this point. I don't have it yet. Help me out. You know, to have someone to, have, to be there with you in your life moments that are Torah moments and Torah moments that are life moments is yeah, such a yeah. blessing. I agree. I, I'm so okay. grateful. And I, I do think it is like, you know, in, in a way that makes Brian and Ray Mary again, like the best model, like they live together, you know, they like, we're constantly living with each other. And so it makes sense. They, they connected over all different things. We have barely ever lived in the same place, the same city even. Um, but uh, sometimes we don't live in the same country, but I think that, that we do have that, like you said, that intertwined life and text and I sometimes date my life of like what was going on that year oh that was the year we were learning Megillah and this was happening in my life and uh and I do think it's so powerful to to have that relationship so I'm very grateful me too I'm very grateful too I'll see you Thursday okay see you Thursday Thank you so much to everyone for joining us. We really enjoyed being a part of the Global Day of Jewish Learning, and we hope that uh, you continue your learning as well. Hi. Bye, Ash. Bye, Han. <laughs>